Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Uh, this was recorded back in November uh, with my friend and co-host, Justin Clark. Uh, as regular listeners know, uh, we've started Red Reviews up again, and Justin is coming at the project with a renewed passion uh, for learning and educating about leftist ideas, theories, and philosophy. This interview is a very good one in which he goes through his fairly recent changes uh, in his philosophical outlook, uh, humanism is at the heart of any good liberatory philosophy, and while I find this uh, to be totally compatible with anarchism, Justin has had some issues reconciling it with the Leninist aspects of his previous outlook. And it makes me happy to hear that his humanism won out when those contradictions became too big to overcome. In the past, some people have said that uh, I should uh, abandon Justin when he joined the PSL and when he was part of the PSL. Uh, but I had faith in uh, Justin as a person and felt that even if the organization that he was a part of was not behaving in the eth in ethical ways, that he would do what was right and stand up for good value. Uh, I shared some of the articles that I've gotten from other people with Justin, and I, I, under I believed that he would uh, approach them with uh, in good faith and with an intellectual honesty. Uh, and I was right. Uh, <laughs> I I'm, guess I, I'm repeating myself by saying that I had faith in Justin as a person. I, I have a faith in him as a, a good, th an honest thinker. And that kept me believing that he would uh, find a way to reconcile being part of PSL with his values or he would leave the organization. And it seems like it wasn't something that he could reconcile, so he left, uh, which we go farther into depth uh, in the uh, discussion. So I don't really have a whole lot other than that to say. I'm happy that Justin is in a better place now. I'm sorry that his grandmother passed and uh, uh, she she passed shortly after this interview was recorded. Um, I consider Justin a very good friend and a, he's a great co-host and I look forward to producing lots of good po podcasts and videos with him for years to come. So with that, <laughs> I have to say thank you to all of my patrons. Uh, patrons make it possible for me to do this show, and at the moment, the money that I get from Patreon is helping to pay for all the services I use to produce the show. If you want to contribute to the production of this show, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Uh, support levels start at a dollar a month or a dollar fifty if you're in Canada. And if you can't support me with money, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just please hit the like button on the video or uh, go and write a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. That stuff help this, helps the show. I always need more ratings and reviews. Um, make sure for those, you can check the links in the show notes to go to Podchaser. Uh, you should also subscribe on YouTube or in the podcast app of your choice so that you can get new episodes regularly. Um, so feel free to contact me uh, by messaging on social media, leaving a comment on YouTube, using the contact form on my website, skepticalleftist.com, or by emailing me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And now that that's all out of the way, here's my interview with Justin. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today, I'm joined by my friend, Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. It's great to be back. Um, it's been a long time since we've done this, uh, and it's, it just feels good to, to sit down again and have a, have a chat. It's awesome. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's been quite a while and, and there have been people asking about you and uh, <laughs> wondering when Red Reviews will start up again. But um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We will get into all of that for sure. <laughs> Sounds good. So I guess for starters, what have you been up to? So the main thing has been really more than anything else working on my health. So this year has been hard for me health-wise. Um, I've, uh, you know, back in December, um, for those who remember watching the Red Review shows, we took a little break because I had sinus surgery, um, which went very, very well. And that has helped me tremendously. Um, I wish I had done it years before, but just never had the, the, the resources at the time to do it. And so I was very lucky to be able to go and, and do that. Um, but this year has just had some health struggles, um, and just other personal struggles too. So like, um, my grandmother, she's 87 years old. Um, and for a while I was serving as a part-time caretaker, um, because, um, she went into hospice in May. And so, you know, it was doing that. And then I was involved with, uh, PSL and I was a PSL organizer. So I was doing that and this and that and the other. 
And starting probably sometime in around June or July, I essentially had what I would largely describe as sort of a physical and mental breakdown. Um, I was pretty tired um, and exhausted. I remember there was one night we were going to do Red Reviews and I had a horrific headache, horrible nausea and fatigue. And I messaged you. I was like, I can't, I can't do the show tonight. I'm sorry. And I laid in, I pretty much went to bed that night about six thirty, seven o'clock and was in bed for the next 12 hours, 12, yeah. 14 hours. Yeah, sometimes um, you gotta, you gotta take care of yourself for sure. Yeah. And so, and so it all kind of culminated in a couple of things. It was just, I've been dealing with chronic headaches the last few years, neck pain, back pain. I, I you know, I, I'm somebody who has chronic pain. So I was trying to figure out the best route to do that. I think we've, I think my doctors and I, we finally figured out, I think a good way to figure that out. So it's a mix of medications, physical therapy and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I was just under a tremendous amount of stress. And then what happened in August was that in August I got COVID. Oh, geez. So it was the first time I'd ever gotten COVID. Um, I had avoided it for two and a half years, um, right. but then I finally got it. Um, I don't know if you've ever had it, Corey, but Not it yet. sucks. <laughs> Not I'm, you are, I'm, you're so lucky. Um, I am so, I want to just say, I'm so grateful for um, the, you know, scientists and the researchers and all the people who busted their ass to develop a vaccine because I was vaccine. I had the two doses of the Pfizer and I had had a booster. So my experience with COVID was pretty mild. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I had one day that was really, really terrible. Um, and then everything else was, was actually pretty manageable. Um, you know, and so I, you know, I tested positive on like August 23rd or 24th. And then about a week and a half later, I started testing negative and I was, I was fine. Um, and then, you know, the only thing in terms of long COVID is like, I don't really have like really terrible long COVID symptoms. So like, I never lost my sense of taste or smell. Good, I never good. got horrible coughs. I, you know, I didn't really, you know, my symptoms were all very, very mild. Um, but you know, I'm still just dealing with a little bit of, you know, respiratory stuff. Basically, like if I go up a flight of stairs or if I'm, you know, exercising, you know, it, it's kind of intense, but I'm getting my energy back slowly, but surely I was in, um, two weeks ago, two so weeks ago, I was in Austin, Texas, um, with my wife and I was there for a week on vacation and she was there on work. And, you know, I spent the week basically just kind of walking all around that city and for, you know, all day. And I was totally fine. Right on. Um, the only time I ever really noticed I was a little winded was going upstairs. That was kind of the only thing. Right on. Um, so, and then the last thing that really kind of happened for me health wise was I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease, which is um, an autoimmune disorder of the thyroid. Basically okay. what it is, is that your body has antibodies that attack foreign uh, agents in your body, whether it's germs or, or viruses or whatever, right? But my body doesn't, can't distinguish between stuff that's foreign and my thyroid. So my body attacks my thyroid. Ah, interesting. And, and for those who don't know, your thyroid is this little gland that sits like right here in your neck and it controls kind of everything. <laughs> um, so it <laughs> controls uh, mood, sleep, uh, cognitive function, skin, um, you know, some people who have Hashimoto's even worse than I do, they can't really sweat very well. Okay. Um, I don't have that. I don't have that problem. Uh, but some people do. Um, and so I've been working with my doctors to try to get the right medication for it. So basically I take a medication for it. So I take a, th a, a synthetic thyroid hormone that I take every day okay. that sort of is a replacement for what my body can't create because my thyroid's messed up. Ah. It's kind of like for a diabetic where they have to have insulin because right. their pancreas doesn't work right. It's the same thing with me. So part of why I think I was having so many issues in the summer with chronic fatigue and headaches and pain was I wasn't, ha I wasn't on the right thyroid di uh, medication mm -hmm. di uh, dosage. And so I was just exhausted. And quite frankly, I was burnt out. And so starting, you know, COVID, COVID really, uh, Basically, COVID was kind of a wake up call. I, I was burned out. I was between my full time job, taking care of my stuff at home, PSL work, and then taking care of my grandma. I was completely burned out. My body was fried. My mind was fried. Right. And so I said, okay, I'm going to take a step back from stuff. The first thing I took a step back from was our show. Yep. Um, you know, and I said, I need a break. I don't want to quit. This is me not quitting. <laughs> uh, I just need a break to figure out what I want to do going forward. Um, and then it was, you know, talking to my dad and just saying like, dad, I can't always come up and, 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 
and we're working on that. And so, you know, it's instead of going up there every weekend, which is what I did to take care of her pretty much every weekend between May and August before I got COVID, I go up there about once a month now. Um, okay. And eventually I'll probably end up starting to go up there twice a month, but right now it's once a month. Um, but the big thing that I did, and that's what we're going to be kind of talking about today, was that I quit PSL. Um, okay. And I quit PSL for a couple of different reasons. One of it was personal and the other was political. So the first one, the personal part was, um, I think I've realized that constitutionally organizing is not for me. Uh, it's not something I like to do. Um, I have no problem with doing activism here and there, but that slog of constantly doing that work all of the time. It's too much. Um, it's too much for me to do. And I don't really... I don't really have the passion for it in yeah. the way that I thought I did. Um, and so I, I resigned from the party. Uh, and part of it was, yeah, I was just tired as burnout. It's too much to do. But the other part of it was that I realized that I thought PSL really represented my politics well, and it kind of doesn't. Okay. So essentially, you know, I texted you a few weeks ago when we set this up and I said, hey, man, like I quit PSL and I don't really consider myself a Leninist anymore. Right. And you had said, OK, well, why? And so my main reason for why I would say I'm no longer a Leninist anymore is because one of the hallmarks of Leninism is belonging to a party. Uh, I don't think anybody can call themselves a Leninist without belonging to some kind of party and doing some kind of party work. That's like oh, kind of a okay. core, like that's a core tenet of being a Leninist, period. And so people who call themselves Leninists who aren't actually involved in any kind of political organizing or, or a party kind of aren't Leninists. They might be in sort of Lin name only. And again, I'm not speaking for them, but from my reading of Lenin and from my reading of, of political philosophy, like that's how it is. And okay. so I thought it would be disingenuous to say, oh, I'm this when I'm not really. And I realized that the right. PSL's politics aren't really for me. And part of that was that it was a little, it was like little things that all added up to big things. So like the first thing okay. was, you know, and, and I don't know how much of this is like talking out of school, but I don't really <laughs> give a shit. Um, but right. basically like when you do PSL classes, cause you, cause the thing about PSL is when you join the party for socialism and liberation, you don't, it's not like DSA where you, you pay tw you know, 30 bucks a year. They send you a card and you're in. It right. doesn't work like that. Okay. Um, it's an organization where you actually have to be properly vetted and there's like a whole membership process to it, which was fine. I enjoyed the classes part of it, but it was the, the, just the subtle things that sort of started to add up. And I went, wait, that's weird. Um, <laughs> the, so the, the first one was, uh, I remember there was one class we took one night and we started to heavily quote Stalin. Oh. And I went, why are we, what, why are we quoting Stalin here? And I think it was like on the national question or something like that. And, and, uh, and I went, well, that's odd. And I'm like, because I don't consider myself a Stalinist. And right. uh, we've talked, we've talked about Stalin on the show. We've talked about how the ways in which sort of the political right have poisoned the well, unlike critique of Stalin or critique of the Soviet Union. But also we don't apologize for the things that he's done. And <laughs> yeah. And, 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 I, and I think, and I think that, that, that uh, there's a lot of, and especially online, a lot of this is like hyper online stuff where right. there's this sort of like glorification of Stalin, which yeah. I find very weird. Yeah, um, it's gross, actually. <laughs> it is, it's, it's really disgusting considering the history of the Soviet Union, which I would say, like any political experiment, with the exception of fascism, fascism is always universally bad. But like with yeah. any political experiment that's not fascism, it has good things and bad things to yeah. it. Um, there were a lot of good things about the Soviet Union, and we've talked about that, the sort of development of its economic production and its advancements of science and technology, and it's, it's right raising the standard of living for a lot of its citizens. And all those things are good, but at the same time, you know, there is a lot of, you know, I, it's, it, it's kind of like Holocaust denial in the sense that, like, there's a whole cottage industry Mm. on the sort of le or what I would call the Stalinist left of or the Stalinist's kind of view of the world where, oh, you know, like the Ukrainian famine didn't happen and the right. show trials were real trials and these people should have been purged and, <laughs> and, you know, Stalin didn't put enough people in the gulag, like that kind of Right. Those rhetoric. are the people who are like, when you're online and you're like, are, 
an anarchist arguing with them, they're like, yeah, well, you'll go in the gulag or you'll get the wall. Yeah. <laughs> like those are those guys. <laughs> and it's, and it's, I think it's for me, it was, and I was trying to figure out how to articulate this with you today, but basically it came down to that my, this kind of view of the world was butting heads with my humanism. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately at the end of the day, like my my opinion of this kind of politics is it is deeply anti-humanistic. It, right. it has very little interest in the dignity and the worth of individual human beings. It, it, it doesn't care because any kind of movement like that, that's what I would call authoritarian or totalitarian, which I think I've said in the past that those words don't mean anything. And I'm full, and I was full of shit then. Like those actually do mean something. I'm sorry. They right. do. Okay. Um, any kind of a totalitarian worldview requires a certain level of people who then have to be purged in order to mm -hmm. make it work. Mm -hmm. So whether it's – Yeah, any uh, dissenter is no good, right? <laughs> any dissenter is no good and any dissenter gets painted as a fascist or yeah. a reactionary or even if they are actually to the left of the ruling party. Right. Like for example, the anarchists who are essentially purged out of the Soviet Union yeah. – um, uh, especially after Kropotkin's death in 1919, because we've talked about this before, like the, when when Kropotkin, Peter Kropotkin, the great anarchist thinker from Russia, who, when he died in 1919, and the anarchists who were in what was emerging as the early, you know, the Russian Soviet Republic, which would become the Soviet Union, that was the last time that they were allowed to organize in public. Right, was for his funeral, and and that was only from Lenin's deference to Kropotkin. That was it. Um, but, uh, and after that, they were pretty much purged. I mean, that's what happened to Emma Goldman. I mean, she lived there for a number of years and then she left and she wrote a whole book about it. Yep. Um, I'm working on an article right now about Eugene Debs and his view of the Bol Bolshevik revolution and the early Soviet government. And he has the same critique, which is mm -hmm. this use of political violence. And, you know, my thing that drives me, I think crazy is when people say, well, you know, they kind of had to do this because of the conditions. It's like, okay, maybe that's fair. But at the same time, why are we, why are we trying to like do this? Like, quite frankly, it's like apologetics for right. what ostensibly was, you know, a lot of human suffering that was needless simply by virtue of the fact that they were not the ones in power. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's part of that is, I think, a component of it. So there was that, and then there was the, you know, they're very pro-North Korea. <laughs> yeah, which is troubling. <laughs> which is extremely troubling considering like – and I would never was. Like I didn't – I and, and and I never knew enough about it, but, but quite frankly, I knew enough to recognize just some basic things. So like, you know, and I think anybody who's like a critical thinker could kind of put those two and two together. So like, okay – so you're building this like socialist world or what you consider this sort of democratic socialist republic. Why are all the leaders of that country named Kim? Right. Yeah. Why is it a dynasty? Like why, why is it that, that there's no like elections? Not to mention <laughs> the fact that one of the things that people don't often know is that like in the 1990s, the North Korean government was completely reorganized. So okay. that the workers party was no longer the sort of ruling apparatus of the country, but the military was. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So they shifted, right? So it's like, if if anybody wants to call North Korea socialism, I think that's like delusional. Right. Like, I, I, I am sorry. I just think that's delusional. Now, does that make what the United States has done in that area of the world like of justified? Not. Absolutely, not. Absolutely not. In fact, I would argue that the United States is – police action that they instituted in 1950 because they couldn't call it a war because they couldn't get a declaration of war. Truman couldn't get it. Right. So they called it a police action that led exactly to the conditions that we have today where yep. we have a bifurcated Korea where the top half of it is this like totalitarian hellscape. And then the bottom half of it is like this hyper capitalist hellscape yep. and they both suck. Like there's, it's not, <laughs> you know, yep. my favorite was, and I haven't watched it, but I read a lot about it, the, the Squid Game show. Oh, yeah. And there were some people who were trying to sort of say, oh, well, this show's about North Korea or whatever. When the creators of the show were very explicit about like, actually, no, this show is about the sort of disgusting hyper-capitalist, hyper-individualist yeah. culture of South Korea. Yeah. Um, well, I think they, uh, and I mean, I don't want to speak for the creators of the show, but there, I thought there was a spot where like there was somebody that was... Uh, they, when they were about to die, wasn't, uh, they were talking about 
dreaming of going back to North Korea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was something like that where it's so like it was almost the a little bit like too much. <laughs> it's like yeah, or it's a commentary. And again, I haven't watched it, so I apologize about talking about something I haven't watched. I've just read. I remember reading that, and the creators talking about it. But basically, that like the read of that could be that like this situation is so bad, I would rather go back to North right. Korea yeah. than do yeah. this. Which I think is I think is a telling telling point. Now, does that mean that every defector who leaves North Korea is telling the truth? Of course, probably not. not. Of course not. <laughs> like somebody like Nomi Park who makes shit up all the time. It's like ridiculous. Like they meet rats and shit. Like I don't believe that. Right? right. Like that doesn't mean that like Radio Free Asia is somehow correct on any of this. But I do think it's important that like if you consider yourself a socialist, like why on earth you would ever support North <laughs> Korea? Like that makes no sense yeah. to me. Yeah. So that was part of it. And then the big part of it was honestly Ukraine. Okay. So I, uh, you know, I think the war in Ukraine is an extremely complicated situation. I don't have a clear answer on it at all. Right. Um, I think it's a mix of things. So, like, the PSL and the Answer Coalition, which is the which is a part of the PSL and its sort of standard sort of party line was, you know, we don't support the invasion of, of uh, that Putin instigated, but here's the conditions that led to it. And so they talk about, obviously, the expansion of NATO – and the United States kind of continually sort of growing NATO to the point where it's like right up against Russia. The fact that there has been essentially a civil war in the Donbass or Eastern Ukraine region for the last eight years, where some people are ethnically Ukrainian and they or and they want to be a part of Ukraine and some are ethnically Russian and they want to be a part of Russia. Mm. And that's and there's been constant, you know, clashes. There was a coup that happened in 2014 right. that was sport, sponsored by the U.S. government. So, again, I want to preface everything I want to, what I'm saying with. This is extremely complicated, one. And two, I – this does not mean that like I support the US or what – you know, like I don't think the United States should be sending money to Ukraine. Like I, I personally don't. Like I think this is the thing that it's like nothing can be gained from the United States continually interfering in other parts of the world to, to try to get its vision. Because like every time it's done it, it's been a massive disaster. The only people right. who have ever benefited from it are the ruling class, right? So whether it's – you know, and you can go all the way back to the 1950s in Guatemala and and the Arbenz, Arbenz government that was overthrown in order to protect the United Fruit Corporation, which is where we get the term banana republic. Like right. that was the United States. You go all the way back to the Philippines, the Spanish-American War. I mean, again, like U.S. imperialism is very much a thing. But I remember asking somebody, I said, now, obviously, the United States has imperial interests in Ukraine, no doubt. But what about Russia? Does Russia have imperial interests? And the answer I got from one of my former colleagues in the PSL was no, because and the just and the argument was pretty facile to me, and 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 it still didn't satisfy. It was like, well, the argu the standard argument that the sort of the Putin crowd will say is that he was asked by the people in the Donbass to come in to protect them from Ukraine. That's like the standard line, right? Okay. I don't buy that. I don't buy that for a second. Okay. <laughs> That's the same logic of, oh, Bush went into Iraq to free the country from Saddam. Like, it's the same yep. kind yep. of logic to me. And I'm like, that's just a post hoc rationalization for the real goal, which is that Ukraine has one of the largest energy deposits in the world that constantly feeds oil and natural gas to Europe. Yep. Okay. A lot of the oil and natural gas that goes to all, almost all of Europe is either from Russia or it's from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Okay. The United States is interested in getting involved in this is that, that there's a sort of pro West leader in Ukraine who will support going after Russia so that the United States can one, have greater control of the region for its resources. Right. And basically it be, and two, to open up the United States energy markets to Western Europe, which is kind of the other big part of it. Um, because the, the price of oil and natural gas is artificially high. Right. Um, and, and because we're actually producing more of it than we ever have, like the United States is like the, is, is, has had the highest level of domestic oil and natural gas production within the last 10 years. I know Canada's story is very similar. Yeah. Um, and so, when I look at the Ukraine Russia conflict, I see what's what I would see as an inter imperialist conflict where the United States is backing Russia to assert its interests in the region and Russia is asserting itself against Russia for its own interests in the region. Because Putin has made 
absolutely no bones about it that he essentially wants to recreate the Russian Empire. Right. Not the Soviet Union. No. Not the Soviet Union. <laughs> and in fact, and in fact, when he gave his big speech about why they did it, he 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 even denounced Lenin's decision yeah. to allow Ukraine to uh, ha- to create itself as its own country in 1922 yeah. and then become a part of the Soviet Union. Yeah. So, you know, and so there's that. Okay. So it's like, and then Putin, him, and, and the, the big argument you'll often hear from the sort of PSL answer coalition crowd is, well, Ukraine is just ridden with Nazis. Right. Which yeah, I've heard part that. Part of that, which, you, <laughs> yeah. I've heard people actually say that you can, call somebody a Nazi because they have the Ukraine flag on their Twitter bio now. So like, and that's absurd. That's absolutely absurd. I mean, the same logic would hold then for the fact that Russia has its own sections of the military that are fascistic and nationalist. And in fact, Putin quotes a Russian fascist all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm much more inclined to believe that Putin is a fascist than every single Ukrainian is. (laughs) Right. And so this is, so basically the, the answer coalition and PSL, they'll say publicly that like, oh yeah, we don't support like the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but kind of implicitly they do. I mean, they kind of do because that, that kind of the way that a lot of MLs online and in the activist space I'm not going to speak for everybody. I'm just kind of give, this is my general impression. Okay. Is that it's essentially their foreign policy idea breaks down to the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. So if it's a country that's an enemy of the United States, it's automatically one that we should give any kind of reverence or support to. So this is how you get people who are like very kind of like on the sort of Marxist Leninist left who consider themselves kind of like pro Russia or like pro Putin. Right. There are a lot that aren't. There are a lot that aren't, including members of the Russian Communist Party, which is <laughs> which which initially backed Putin's idea, but then because they had sort of gotten assurances that it was going to be a limited conflict, why anybody believes that is like beyond me. <laughs> yeah, because it never fucking is. So. Um, but then some of them end up being imprisoned, and then they they get big time buyer's remorse. So it's like so. You have this situation where, in my opinion, what's going on in there is an inter-imperialist conflict. But I keep being told this narrative that, like, really, the only imperial part of it is from the United States. And, like, I don't buy that. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. I don't buy that. Like That doesn't so, match my understanding of imperialism. <laughs> no, it doesn't. And I'm sorry, but, like, and this is going to be, like, I guess, like, blasphemous, but, like, Imperialism, it can be defined far broader or in different ways than what Lenin said it was. Lenin is just a guy. <laughs> He's just a guy who wrote about imperialism very well yeah. and brought some really interesting ideas to the table. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's not true, but imperialism can be defined many different ways. And so, you know, so I kept hearing the whole, well, if you define it by the Leninist definition, then what Russia is really doing is an imperialistic blah, 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 blah. And this is the thing I think that's very interesting is that we talk all the time about, you know, judge you by your fruits, right? Like, show me what you do, not what you say. Because right. politicians talk, 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 talk all the time. It's all a matter of what you actually do, yeah. right? So when, you know, and that's why, like, I don't think, like, Zelensky's that good a guy either. You right, know, Like, right. shutting down opposition parties, you're shutting down newspapers and television stations and centralizing power. And like, no, like and the, Zelensky's kind of a scumbag too. The whole, like don't, <laughs> the yeah. whole liberal thing where they were like worshiping like a, him, like a superhero was really fucking weird and really gross. It's very, very strange. <laughs> and it just goes to show you how far we've come that the anti-war movement is pretty much dead. I mean, it died with Obama. Yeah. That mainstream liberals no longer have, what I would consider sort of generally either anti-war or anti-imperialist politics. They no, just don't. No. There are some that there are some rare exceptions to that, but the ones that I can think of are either not really a part of the national conversation or they're dead. I mean, it's like, you know, like I think all the time about one of my favorite writers who I've been doing sort of a retrospective on my Instagram account with uh, is Gore Vidal. Oh yeah. yeah. And, Gore, and, and, you know, and I think Gore Vidal would be appalled by, not only what Putin is, has and the Russian government has done, but also that the United States continues to pour billions and billions of dollars into this when it's essentially a stalemate. Yeah. And so, 
you know, my ideal version of it is, quite frankly, that the United States and, you know, Russia and Ukraine need to get in a room and figure it out. Like, I, I, I don't really see why, you know, the United States, we have so many problems in our country <laughs> That are, that are not being resolved. You know, the water is still absolutely toxic in Jackson, Mississippi, and yet somehow we can continue to send billions to Ukraine. Right. Why are we doing that? That's like, to me, this is going to, this is like, there have been murmurings that, because today is, you know, this will come out later, but today is the midterm election day here in the United States. Right. And there are murmurings that if Republicans take back Congress, that they'll cut off the aid to Ukraine. I don't think that's going to happen think for so. a second. Yeah, no. I don't think that's going <laughs> to, I don't buy that for a minute because- I'm sorry, but when it comes down to it, when it comes to foreign policy, the parties are often indistinguishable. Yep. They kind of do the same thing. So, and maybe they won't give as much, maybe they won't be as generous, but I don't think it's going to end. No. And anybody who thinks so is delusional. And right? they These love, are the same people. They all yeah. love uh, military spending. They just love it. Like, they all just... do. I mean, <laughs> my U.S. Senator, Todd Young, met with members of the Azov Battalion. So, like, you know, which which is basically the super fashy part of the Ukrainian military. Yeah. Um, so, like, yeah. So when people say, like, well, Ukraine has a Nazi problem. Well, no shit it does. But, like, Russia has a Nazi problem. The United States Everybody has a fascism has a problem. Nazi problem. The right globe <laughs> has a Nazi problem, right? Like, the globe has a fascism yeah. problem. Yeah. You know, to me, these are sort of fat. These are sort of facile arguments because it's it's essentially the same arguments that the Bush administration used when it invaded Iraq, which right. is that. First, they did it with the weapons of mass destruction. Then people realized that was a lie. So then they pivoted to, well, this is a humanitarian conflict. We're freeing this country from a dictator, which is like, okay, fine. But like, yeah, Saddam was a shitbag. But also like the United States essentially had him as a client for years. Uh They didn't have any problems with him before. (laughs) Oh, did I lose you? I I lost you for a second. Sorry. Yeah, they didn't have any problems with Saddam before. So it was just very convenient. (laughs) They only had problems with it when he invaded Kuwait. In, in, in 90, 91, which again, and part of that was, I guess, was a part of it was that because Kuwait was essentially U.S. turf mm. and, and he fucked with U.S. turf. I mean, it really came down to that. So, um, so again, I think that there's a, there's a lot of good people in PSL. I don't think they're all horrible. I largely left because I realized that quite frankly, I don't really want to belong to an organization anymore. I, I'm happy to support organizations. I'm happy to do stuff like that. But I've realized I've been in many different groups over the last 15 years and I've left all of them. And the common denominator in all of that is me. <laughs> and, and I've realized that what I prefer to do is this, which is to you know, share my point of view, educate people, be an historian, be an educator. Yeah. That's what I'm much more interested in doing. And so I left PSL and I don't regret it one bit. Um, there's also some other structural stuff about the party, especially its financing that I didn't love. That oh, okay. wasn't really fully disclosed to me. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's – and then like obviously like the other thing that I did more than anything else was when I when I left, I went back – and I really gave that article that you sent me a real thorough read. Oh, like yeah. I actually went through and I actually read more of it and went kind of back and I went, yeah. <laughs> so like there are, and I'm not going to say this is to everybody, but there are definitely elements I think within that sort of Marxist Leninist space or anti-imperialist space or whatever, where essentially they're kind of like comfortable with dictators so long as they are enemies of the United States. Yeah. So like right now, one of the things you're going to hear a lot on the internet is that we shouldn't support the protesters in Iran. This is the one thing that is driven me. We shouldn't. Really? That, that essentially there's a part of the sort of, uh, I think the online left, some who even still follow me who think that we shouldn't because essentially if we do, then that's just giving the U S ammunition for regime change that because that, that's they they basically say well because this is being covered so much in western media uh, it has to be it has to be silliness because it has to be the united states sort of instigating regime change so that can so here's the thing <laughs> right there are two things can happen at the same time right so like yes the united states or western media could be covering this to sort of try to drum up regime change or interest in regime change. Sure. No shit. Like, obviously. Yeah. At the same time, to say that everybody in these countries who are protesting is are a just like pawn, of, yeah, is a puppet right. of the United States is like total bullshit because most of them don't give a fuck what the United States 
Like, like they don't give a shit. Yeah. Like, or if they do, they're just like, and that's what the general, like I read a great article from Jacobin recently about this, where they interviewed some people. Cause a lot of the people who are protesting in Iran right now are young people. They're people who are, you know, five, 10, 15 years younger than you and me. Right. They're zoomers. Right. A lot of them are not as sort of explicit. Like, and the general consensus is we fucking hate the mullahs. We fucking hate the Shah and we don't want the United States involved. We just want to have freedom. It's like that simple, right? <laughs> and it's like, I mean, and so, yeah, it's like, so I think, and I, you know, I put a post out on my Instagram. I was like, you know, down with theocracy, up with democracy. And I got somebody who commented, who sent me a message saying, hey, like, you know, I just think this is all an excuse for regime change, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, I don't support the United States unilaterally going in and changing the regime no. of a country at all. That's bullshit. And I don't support that. Yeah. But anytime that there's some kind of grassroots organization of, of people, by the way, who are the fucking working class who actually are trying to assert themselves and yeah. try to make their society more free and open and democratic, we should support that. Yeah. And we I don't can't just understand. go like, well, they're going to be used by the U.S. to regime change <laughs> like every time. You know, as it's like, it's like, it's like the United States becomes like Hydra, where it's it's got its it's got its fingers and everything, which is true. I'm not going to say that's not necessarily true, right? But like, but like at the same time, it just completely takes away the agency of these people, yeah. Because yeah. you know they have their own serious concerns, and maybe. As, you know, as your little sort of internet leftist, maybe you should take a hot minute and read a little bit before you spout off about this shit. So that's kind of the thing is realizing that for me, I think I'm so tired of, I'm tired of the dogma. I'm tired of the doctrine. I'm tired of the party line. I'm so sick of this shit. So it's, there, there is a, there's a part of me that's like, what I want to do is I want to support reforms or social movements that advance the well-being and the and the and the and the interests of the working class that's what i care about yeah. okay and and so you know so at this point you know what i can still consider myself a marxist to a greater or lesser extent yes um, sure. i think what i'm a part of is what i would call it's it's broadly called the marxist humanist tradition um, cool. which was a tradition that sort of came out of the Soviet thaw in the 1950s after Stalinism sort of collapsed and the crimes of that era were sort of laid out pretty clear. Um, people like Eric Fromm and uh, Ernst Bloch and Lizette Kolakowski, these guys were all, you know, to a greater or less, lesser extent dissidents. I mean, essentially they didn't support the United States, but they didn't support the United, they didn't necessarily like support everything the United States did, but they also didn't support the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and in Kalikowski's case, he was from Poland. He was in Soviet era Poland and was very critical of Stalinism. And it was essentially forced out of Poland. He would, he would eventually go to, to London to, to do the rest of his career. Um, I think that in many ways, I don't think that Stalinism is Marxism. I think it's a perversion of Marxism. I think it's a bastardization of Marxism. Yeah. It's a gross caricature of what Marx would have wanted. I think if, if, if Marx had lived that long, he would never have supported it. Yeah. I, I have all. to agree. <laughs> so. I mean, I just, I don't, I don't, I just feel like, you know, you know, so it's, it's, and again, it's also important to like, understand that, you know, cause this is the argument you'll get into when people, you talk about like the repression and, and, you know, the people who died under certain regimes or whatever, like, well, the United States or great Britain is like that too. No shit, man. Yeah. Like, and they like, fucking suck for it. <laughs> and they suck too. And they, and in many ways, they're far worse. Like, this isn't a fucking contest. No, that's right. I just, just I don't think support it's so, shitty, shitty people and shitty states. Yeah, just, you know, I believe in building a world that's more democratic. Yeah. You know, and that's not just in going in and going and voting, which, you know, I've been back and forth on voting. I voted in the midterms. I, I I have no illusions about the limitations of voting. Yeah. People who see it as the end all end uh, end all be all, I think, are misguided. Yeah. I think it's a very small part of a broader picture, which is to be an informed citizen, which is to en get engage in you know discussions like we're doing, uh, getting involved in other activities or anything that you know you genuinely believe in and care about. Um, those are all important, um, and I think that when People say, oh, well, the parties are the same. Well, on a lot of the big stuff, yes, they are. Like on some of the big stuff. But on a lot of other stuff, they're fucking not. Right. Okay. Right. Like, 
You know, is the Democratic Party waging a war against trans people in the United States? No. But the other party is. Yeah, that's right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it, it, you know, is are, are Democratic governors sending, you know, undocumented immigrants to other parts of the, <laughs> the country just out of spite to be mean? Uh, no, that's Republicans doing that. Yeah. Do uh, do Democrats show up with guns and flak jackets at polling places and tail people after they vote? No, Republicans do that. So, and again, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not saying this is like, yay, the Democratic Party is wonderful. Like, right. no, I've I you've heard me criticize Democratic Party multiple times, and part of the reason why we're in the shit show that we're in is because of the total lack of leadership from the Democratic Party. Yeah, and but at the same time, it's like on some stuff, actually, no, they are they actually are different, and that there are times where voting truly is harm reduction. Okay. Like it really is. Now, does that mean that I totally support Democrats completely? Absolutely not. I've been absolutely disappointed in the way in which the, the sort of the squad have been so gung ho about the Ukraine stuff. Yeah. That has been extremely disappointing to me. And, and, you know, but it, but it's not out of nowhere. I mean, it, it's, you know, because they are part of the mainstream political apparatus. They're part of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party supports this. Um, and I always get a kick out of people when they say, well, the Democratic Party has become the party of war now. And it's like, do you not know your history? <laughs> like, well, you know, like when World War I happened, the president was a Democrat and it yeah. was a Democratic Congress. When World War II happened, it was a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress. When the Vietnam War happened, it was a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress. Like, like this idea that somehow... Now like the Republicans the are always are... the war party. And it's like so silly. Yeah. And it's again, it's just a, it's a complete, it's just a complete ig ignorance of history. So ultimately, you know, these days, like, you know, I, I you know, it's, I would call myself a Marxist humanist or an independent socialist. I, I, I'm not, I don't, I, I'm much more interested. And I guess maybe it's because I'm, I'm just anything that kind of, anything that kind of like, feels like religion to me is very like is very distasteful to me. Yep. Yep. And being part of PSL kind of felt very religion y. Ah. And and I didn't like that at all. Where, you know, there's the organization and then there's the party line. I just remember somebody I saw online that I knew or whatever, and I'm not I'm not gonna say names and I'm not saying this to like shit on them specifically. I'm although it's gonna kinda sound like that, but it, it's <laughs> Is it's like they said, well, they said something along the lines of like, I submit myself to the doctrine of Marxism Leninist. It's like, what the fuck is this? Like, what? Yeah. Like, Not a like, fan of that. <laughs> like, that's gross. Like, what on earth? Like, yeah. what are you fucking talking about? And that gets back to, and I gotta, I have to find it. Um, but, you know, there was a, you know, there was a, uh, there was a thing I had shared out from, uh, one of my Instagram followers, and I really, really liked it. And I shared it out and I thought it was brilliant. So this was a, this was, I don't know if this was like on like a discord or on like a, a thing, Okay. but, but I want to read this cause I think it's really good. And I think it's like the, it was like the nail in the coffin for me in terms of like, okay, I'm done. So it says hot take of the day, a worrying number of leftists are actually just evangelical Christians with the serial numbers fil filed off. So the world is – and so it basically goes through this paragraph and it changes like religious language to put in like sort of generally leftist okay. language. So it's like the world is a sinful – cross out si sinful – a capitalist hellscape. But we just have to wait until the second coming and then that's crossed revolution. out. And it says the revolution <laughs> happens when everything will be magically fixed. Any attempt to make actual progress makes you a lukewarm Christian – Liberal. Crossed out. <laughs> Liberal. Anything less than the apocalypse, uh, crossed out the revolution, yeah. which we are forever waiting for, by the way, is completely useless. Also, consuming certain media or making certain lifestyle choices is uh, cross out sinful and unchristian bad praxis. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I shared that out on my Instagram stories. I said, yes, 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 yes. So here's the problem I have with... <laughs> This whole stuff, okay? So I think sometimes a lot of these political movements have what I call the when does Jesus come back problem. Yeah. And we've talked about this before. And that's not to say that we shouldn't support like a radical transformation of society or revolution in an idea or whatever. Yep. That's a whole other discussion. But when you just say everything will be better once the revolution happens is bullshit. You don't know that. Yeah, that's right. You don't know that. 
You, the, you when, literally when the Russian, don't know what's going to happen after the revolution. You don't know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. Like most revolutions don't don't succeed. Yeah. Most of them fail. And the ones that do succeed, they succeed after much hardship. You know, the, the, the you know the Bolsheviks didn't just take over. There was a civil war that went on for essentially five years. Right. Yeah. Where there was massive amounts of bloodshed and human misery to get to where they wanted to go. And in many ways, that conflict set up, in many respects, the conditions which would make Stalinism work, you know? And so I think that we just have to be so much more honest about, like, what we're trying to achieve. Like, it's not to say we shouldn't give up the ID revolution or not consider that or not have that be a part of it, because obviously reformism certainly has its limits. But at the same time, right, there are people who are suffering now. There are people who have problems now. Yeah. And if you're going to go out there, and, and, and this is what the late, great Michael Brooks used to always say, if you're going out there and you're fucking cosplaying revolution, yeah. then you're delusional yeah. and you need to get your hat out of your ass and you need to start thinking a little bit more. You need to start thinking like an adult. Like, it, it, I mean, it just, you know, and that's not to say that we shouldn't give up the idea of setting up a better world. Like, this is something I, I've been reading a, an incredible book, and maybe we'll do it on, on another show, but a book called Toward a Marxist Humanism, which is by Lizette Kolakowski. Okay. And he talks about the idea of how do we make a new left that works that is not because at the time, he's writing this stuff in the 50s and 60s. So it's a, it's a direct response to Stalinism. Mm -hmm. And, and, what he's saying is, you know, the left should never, ever give up the idea of utopia. We exist to defend and to fight for what is seen, what is seen by many as the impossible. Right. That's what we seek to do. That's why when you go in and you're advocating for something, you don't, you don't do what a lot of the Democratic Party does, where you just do this like half-assed, oh, I support a public option or, oh, I believe in, you know, yeah. transferring some community. No. Like that idea of saying Medicare for all or defund the police, like we may not get fully Medicare for all, but when you fight for it, you're going to get a hell of a lot more than if you start from nothing yep. or you start from this half-assed compromise, right? Like we, we dare to demand the impossible and that's a good thing. That's something we should never give up. Yep. That sense of, that sense of, of awe and wonder at the possibilities of who we can be is something that has been blotted out by political ideologies consistently over the last few decades. You know, this Mark Fisher talks about this, the idea of capitalist realism. Right. We have to get beyond that shit. But we also have to get beyond what I would call the sort of Stalinist realism, which is this idea that, well, you know, this, this method has been tried. We know it works. Spoiler alert, it doesn't always work because the <laughs> Soviet Union collapsed. And so did Yugoslavia. And like, it's like all these, like, you know, like the, the you know, it's, they work until they don't yeah. like, it's like, okay, you know, and like, and like, we can have like a genuine conversation about whether it's China is socialist. Sure. I think it's how you, def it's how you define it. You know, I, I would say in some respects, I think what they have is state capitalism In other respects, it's, it's, you know, it's more like market socialism. Right. But is it really like, you know, there's a lot of good things about that system. For example, the fact that a million, it didn't kill a million people with COVID. Right. Like they did COVID immensely better, better than we did. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, there are huge problems to that system, whether it's freedom of speech and, and freedom of assembly and the right to protest and yeah. the, and the right for other kinds of political reforms. Like the, those don't happen. The thing about China that always gets to me is the extreme punishment for uh, drug use or drug, uh, yeah. distribution. Uh, in my opinion, a liberatory society does not do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. and, 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 and a liberatory society doesn't have the death penalty. Right. Which is yeah, ever. kind of the other thing yeah. ever. Like, like in fact, there in, in the early 1920s during the, the, the early years of the Soviet system, there were the social revolutionaries who were on trial for, you know, crimes against the state or whatever. And social revolutionaries were sort of to the right of the Bolsheviks who were in power, the party, the party apparatus. And Eugene V. Debs writes to Lenin personally mm. and says, can you please not kill them? Can you can you live up to essentially what Lincoln called the better angels? Can you can you show the world that you can be better than the people who came before you? And it was one of the few times where I think 
they kind he kind of took that advice and they didn't they didn't execute those two men. So like you know those those leaders. So but but I think that's important. Like yeah. Debs doing that because here's the thing. Because here's the thing about Debs. He did that, but he also simultaneously had incredible amount of respect for Lenin and Trotsky. Right. Believed in the Russian Revolution. Believed in the early Soviet Republic and defended it consistently in public. While simultaneously criticizing them publicly and saying and disagree and saying what his disagreements were, yeah, because it's not That's, all or yeah. you know it's not a hundred percent in all or, or nothing, yeah. <laughs> and it's not all or nothing. That's religious thinking. That's the way yeah. that fanatics think. And Debs, because he had a conscience, understood that. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. Is it's like we're so obsessed with having the right party line or the right ideology that we lose our fucking humanity in the process. Yeah. And I think that that's so important, you know, like, I think it's going to be really hard to convince people that, (laughs) that like, what we want to seek to do is build a version of the Soviet Union in the United States. (laughs) Like, like, I don't want to do that. I don't. It's, I dare it, dare I say it, it's impossible. (laughs) Yes, it's impossible. (laughs) And anybody who would consider themselves a Marxist or anybody who would consider themselves on the left who understand history and material forces would tell you that it's not possible because every country is different. Yeah. Every society is different. The, the, you know, and that was the real contributions of people, you know, despite I think their enormous flaws, people like Lenin and Mao who understood that like we just can't take Marxism as it's been developed in Western Europe and plop it into Russia or plop it into China. We have to sort of adapt it to our own material conditions and our own needs and our own situations like that's right i know that sounds like i know that sounds like really simple to say but it's true yeah and so because ultimately what i believe in is i believe i genuinely believe in the capacity for human freedom and i don't say that like in the sort of like you know sort of the sort of neocon bullshit way of of, right uh, but i genuinely believe it in the sense that what i want is i want to live in a world where people are free to speak their minds free to choose the life they want and that they're free to move, Mm. that they can go where they want to and the freedom to say, no, no, I will not do that. No, I will not do this, you know? And because I think it's important for people to remember that the, the legacy of, you know, for all of its failures, like the legacy of liberalism is not something we should just like throw out well, like you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, like right. You can take me, good stuff out of there. <laughs> you can take stuff good out, stuff out of it, because you know, because Marx never saw himself as uh, as a as a rebuttal or like a refutation of the Enlightenment. Right. He saw what he was trying to do as the fulfillment of it. Most socialists do. Yeah. Whether you're anarchists or Marxists or whatever, we all see us as part of this continuing Enlightenment project, which is about the worth and dignity of human beings and the societies that we build together. Yep. And it isn't this binary of individualism versus collectivism. It's not that stupid shit yes. that you're going to hear. <laughs> you know, it's not because when you build healthy collectives, individuals also flourish. The dichotomy and is w- false. <laughs> it's a, it's a false dichotomy. <laughs> and, 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 and it's like, cause you can only, because and this goes back to Hegel. This is something Zizek talks about. It's like I can only understand myself in reference to others. Yes, yeah. like that's how it works. So yeah, it's a false dichotomy. And you know, so does this mean I'm like because because I remember when I left PSL and my wife asked me, she's like, "Are you are you still a socialist?" I said, "Without a doubt." Right. If anything, I am more I am more committed to socialism than I was before in the sense that I genuinely believe that my job is to be somebody who articulates the history and the philosophy of these ideas in a broad brush that, you know, so we are, you know, I'm on one breath where we might talk about Lenin. We might be talking about Mao. We might be talking about Chomsky or Murray Bookchin. I just got a copy of the ecology of freedom a while back. Um, And, you know, and, and I think that, you know, there's no blueprint that says we have to do something this way. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, if any, if anybody, the history of the human race tells us that like humans have, have organized their lives in many, many different ways and there's no set way and that we can actually dare to ask, hey, maybe we should do this differently or why do we do it like this? 
Or why is that such a problem? Like we should ask those questions. And I think when you get so obsessed with labels and with doctrines and with camps, it all just, you lose your sense of humanity because then you start seeing people as others. Yep. That, You're an other. That's true. You're not part of my tribe, right? Part of the reason that I became a socialist was to leave the tribalist bullshit right. of mainstream politics. Turns out that sometimes the tribalism in our part of the political world is worse. And you know that better than I do. I mean, you're more on social media than I am sometimes <laughs> when it comes to dealing with dipshits. It's terrible sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but like, I think it's, it's, we, we are not beholden to anything. That's the, I think that's the thing people think it's like, oh, well, you have to do it like this because this, well, no, we don't like w explain to me why we have to do a revolution. We have to do something exactly the way that Lenin did or exactly the way that the anarchists in Spain did. Like, right, tell me right. why, because I'm sorry, I don't buy that. We can learn from them. Absolutely. And I think learning those historical lessons are important. As a historian, I believe in that wholeheartedly. Yeah. But this idea that you can just sort of copy and paste that shit is like ridiculous to me. Yeah. Doesn't work. And so I just I, I just find it like outlandish because ultimately I value my independence. Like I value my sense of independent critical thought. I value that. And I know you do too. Yeah. And and you don't get to have that when you're part of like a very excuse me, when you're a part of an extremely top down political organization. Yeah. You know? Yep. Basically, I had to tell them every show we did. Oh, really? When I was in PSL, I had, they, they asked me, they, I had to basically, and sometimes I had to clear things with them. Yeah, that's fucked up. <laughs> which I was like, fine, whatever. But like, but I had to keep a schedule, which actually helped because then it was like, okay, I know what's coming up. Like yeah. before we, before I joined PSL, we, this was a little more loose when we did red reviews. So that they did, they did instill in me a sense of organization, which I did appreciate. But, but at the same time, then like, or it's like, I, I remember one time I, you know, because every, about once a year, I will give a, I will give a speech at the Heartland Unitarian Universalist Church here in Carmel. Oh, yeah. It's about 15 minutes north of where I live. And this past year I did one and I wrote about Eric Fromm, who was a Marxist humanist and I wrote about him. And I remember saying that to one of my former PSL colleagues and they just mentioned in passing instead of going like, oh, well, that sounds interesting. Tell me more about it, which is what I'd like to hear. Yeah. They said of the, oh, it would have been nice to know that was happening. We would have really appreciated a heads up and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, man. Like, I want <laughs> to be my own person. <laughs> like, like, you're not in charge of my life. So, like, that's, like, that's the part of it that I just don't like at all. And I think that, like, and quite frankly, I don't think you're ever going to get Americans to buy into that. No. Uh, no we're, right. we're too goddamn independent. For better or worse, yeah. we're, we're too damned independent to do that. So, There's there's a, a line where individualism is fantastic and a line where it becomes like almost as toxic, right? Like where like U.S., the U.S. culture is almost too individualistic with no yeah. reference for collectivism and no, no community sense, right? But also yeah. like you still have to have individuals and everybody is an individual fitting within the society they fit in. Like, <laughs> right. We are not, we are not lone wolves. There was a book that we were going to do on red reviews. Then I went before it went on hiatus, but it was a book we had talked about it before called the upswing, which was a book by two social scientists, uh, Robert Putnam and Shailen Garrett. And that book is incredible because it really lays out how, Starting in, and I'll just give like a brief kind of overview here, because I think it's important about what happened to the United States. Why is it so fucked up? Well, the United States has been in this place before, and it was called the Gilded Age, where you have this era of, you know, the Supreme Court and the, and the government basically being owned by the, the big, big business. You had extreme inequality. You had, you had, pan you literally had pandemics in the case of like the, the flu outbreak in 1918, 1917, 1918. You had rampant corruption and graft. Um, those are all a part of what would become the Gilded Age. And there was a whole generation of reformers who, again, were not perfect. And trust me, they had their own problems with eugenics and sort of racism and all that. But there were a whole generation of, of leaders who said, actually, no. The United States is healthier and is a better society when we actually like collectively organize and put together solutions to problems. And that was the progressive era. So this is the era where you get 
the progressive income tax. This is right. the era where you get the you know where you get some of the antitrust laws where they break up they broke up big corporations they broke up banks they regulated they regulated money they you know they banned child labor or they limited child labor they fought for unions you know um, that uh, you know they, they, there was a whole era that was probably basically from like the night from like 1900 to about 1960 where uh, where that whole era is sort of that peak of sort of communitarian liberalism that, that argued that actually, yeah, I am my brother and sister's keeper yeah. um, or non-binary, non-binary person's right. you know, keeper. Yeah. And, uh, and, but what happened was that all broke down and it broke down for a variety of reasons. And quite frankly, in America, it broke down because we gave up an ethic of we for an ethic of me. Right. We gave it up for an ethic of me, 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 what I want, what I need. And instead of being a culture that was interested in everybody's shared collective interests, right? This is the Bruce Springsteen line where, you know, nobody wins till everybody wins, right? That whole idea, you know, which was behind. No one is know, free until all are free. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No one's free until all are free, right? Like this is the this was the idea of the progressive movement. It was the idea of the New Deal, and it was the idea of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. Um, but that had internal tensions, right? Mm. You know, so like, while Lyndon Johnson is doing some of the most progressive reforms of any president before or since, he's also pushing the war in Vietnam, and that con and that contradiction is at the heart of 20th century liberalism, and it breaks it apart. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that that when we gave up that ethic of we and, and we're in this together, um, that we all sort of rise and fall together as a, as a society um, into an ethic of me. It's what about what I want, what I need. I really think that's when things started to shift and we went back to being more unequal. We went back to being more selfish, more narcissistic yeah. um, and and more corrupt, more, you know, oligarchic. You know, I mean, right now we have essentially a man baby owning one of the largest digital, uh, you know, digital common spaces yeah. in the world. And one man who owns all of that. Right. And it recalls to me the Gilded Age of somebody like a William Randolph Hearst. Right. Who owned, you know, the, the, the major newspapers in the United States and used those newspapers to proffer lies and misinformation that got us into the to the Spanish American War, um, so it's not that you know the difference is is that you know Hearst was a lot smarter and a bit more <laughs> finesse than Musk does. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's kind of the difference between like the oligarchs of today versus the oligarchs of the Gilded Age. You know, say what you want about people like Johnny e. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie, but they actually did shit. Right. Like you know, like you know, like whether when it with whether it was Rockefeller with you know with. Uh, implementing refining processes in kerosene to develop standard lighting for using kerosene or just oil in general. And when with, with Carnegie, it was implementing the Bessemer process of steel, which is cheaper and easier to make and also better. Like they actually did shit. Like, I don't really think like Zuckerberg doesn't do anything. No, you know, you know Zuckerberg doesn't do anything. Um, he burn, you know, he Elon burns Musk, Facebook to the ground. That's what he's saying. He burns Facebook <laughs> to the ground and, and, and develops essentially a version of The Sims where no one has legs. <laughs> it's 2022. Why can't we have legs? And apparently they fixed this. Apparently they had some like big, big to do yeah. where they actually gave the avatars in the metaverse um, well, what legs, do you which, do? We have legs. I mean, but, but you know, is it's, you know, or it's like Cornelius Vanderbilt building railroads and like, you know, so it's like, at least with the robber barons, like they actually, they actually did shit. Yeah. These people don't do anything. I mean, so, you know, that's my whole thing. It's, it's like, we need to rebuild that sense of an ethic of we, and the way we do that is by, um, you know, engaging in different kinds of ideas, having critical conversations, getting involved in organizing, if that's for you or activism or you know, writing your elected representatives or holding their feet to the fire at a town hall or whatever you do, there's, you know, I'm never going to like activism shame where I'm right. never going to tell you, oh, you should do this or, oh, you should do that. Like do what you feel comfortable doing. Um, but we do need to do more of, of all of those things to build the, the better world that we want to. Well, we're coming up on the time I got to get going, but. Uh, okay. I'm really, before we go, I just want to say, I'm really glad you're not, 
<laughs> in that anymore. The more, since we last were together, I read more on the PSL and I have encountered many, many Marxist Leninists. And I, every time I argued with them and felt like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? I, I, I was like, but, but Justin's a Marxist Leninist. It can't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, 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 I also find it very interesting that there's kind of an overlap with the sort of some of those people online and the sort of Pat Soches, the, the, the sort of yeah. uh, the MAGA, MAGA, dark MAGA shit. It was just like ridiculous. But yes, no, you're you're absolutely <laughs> right. I think most of these people are psychotic and live in a live in a fantasy world. Um, and so, yeah, I'm you know, I I'm I wanted to put my humanism first. And, and I recognizing that, that sure. and and when I recognized that this stuff was in direct con- was in like direct conflict with my humanism, I went, I'm out, I'm done. And so, yeah, um, the other big part of it is that I and I actually have it here. I finished reading this. Ah, and uh, this book is so important <laughs> and and uh into my thinking and about like, oh yeah, like when I was talking earlier about like nothing says we have to do things certain ways. And if you look at human history, we've done it all kinds of different ways before. Yeah. This book goes into that. So uh yes, I'm very happy to be back. And I think that we're gonna have to hash out details and all of that, but I can confidently say that Red Reviews is coming back without a doubt. Fantastic. Um and so we'll figure out details later. Um, and if it's cool with you, I think the first one I'd like to do when we come back is the dawn of everything. Absolutely. Um, and I will try uh, to finish the audiobook version before that. <laughs> oh, I've been reading. I re- it took me on and off because I was reading a bunch of other things, doing other stuff. This book t- took me like six months to get through. Yeah. Um, and but I loved reading every bit of it, and there's so much there. And I know we won't be able to cover it all, but I want to talk about it. Um, but yes, Red Reviews is coming back. I'm, you know, I believe that this is, this is my mission. This is the stuff I think that I'm really passionate about, the stuff that I want to do. Um, and I'm, I want to thank everyone who asked about me and were wondering how I'm doing or what's going on. I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. That means the world to me. Um, that what I do is important to people. Um, that, that means a lot. And so, yeah, Red Reviews is going to come back and it's going to be a much more loose style because I'm, like I said, we're in a new era where, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not towing a party line anymore. So we can kind of talk about anything and I don't, and I don't really care. Um, So yeah, Uh, but yeah, it's coming back. So yeah, we'll have to figure out the details, but, but yes, it's coming back for sure. Good stuff. Well, I guess uh, the last thing is where can people find you? People can always find me at justinclark.org. That's my website. Um, my latest piece for The Truth Seeker ha- was an article I wrote a while back about Emma Goldman, the great anarchist, and her views on atheism and humanism. Um, and then um, my next article that will be coming out, I'm working on that Debs in the Soviet Union piece for my actual day job. That will probably be my next presentation that I will do at Midwestern History next year. Um, and then the other thing I'm working on is I'm putting together a review of Mike Rinder's new book, A Billion Years. Mike Rinder, who was one of the highest level leaders of Scientology. Ah. Um, uh, ben Burgess reached out to me again. He was like, man, I didn't mean I meant to get back to you forever ago about doing this episode about Scientology. Um, but but, you know. If you'll humor me, hopefully maybe we can do an episode of Red Reviews on Mike Rinder's book. Because I, um, I, I, as people who may not know, I've, I've been following Scientology stuff for years and I'm very interested in it. Uh, you know, not as a belief system, as a horrible, <laughs> yeah. you know, disgusting as cult. As an examination should, of. <laughs> a, a, a examination of. Um, but Rinder was one of the highest level members of the church and he left and has become a very prominent whistleblower and this is his memoir so i'll be right i'll be writing an article about that for the truth seeker probably the beginning of the year um and yeah so that's where people can find me um and uh i can't thank you enough Corey, for being so kind and gracious during my struggles this year and i i can't thank you enough for providing me the opportunity to do what i love which is to share ideas and have interesting conversation. Uh, so thank you so much. I, I, I couldn't ask for a better show partner. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I guess before we go, thank you, some random geek, for uh, viewing and 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 uh, ch uh, making some comments. I didn't I didn't see them because I had uh, the chat me and Justin in full screen. But thank you very much for uh, being there. Oh, thank you, some random geek. I appreciate it. All right, and we will check, talk to you later. Yeah, we'll be back soon. Stay tuned, folks. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Uh, thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me spend more time on this and my other project. If you want to contribute to all of that, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating and a review on the podcast app of your choice would be great. If you want to find out more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes uh, for links to all of my stuff and check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. Um, there you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, uh, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, the videos I do with my uh, friend Damien Marie at Hope, and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. Uh, you can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for listening and or watching. So, and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Go join a local org or uh, print off some posters and pamphlets and spread some propaganda.